Hello everyone. Today we are going to be learning all about germs while we paint a fun little drawing that I made about the good, the bad, and the bubbly. Because when we're talking about microorganisms, the truth is some are good, some are bad, and some make a lot of bubbles. They make gases. So let me bring you closer so you can see our artwork. And I just dropped a link in the chat. If you can't find it, go to patreon.com slash science mom. And there's a post called All About Germs. And it has this printout, which you can print. And then you can color along with me. Hello real quick to David and Hayden and Jane and Sarah and Brenda. Love cat meow meow. Good to see you guys here. Now, let's start by introducing the paints that I'm going to be using. But you don't need to use these same paints. You can use markers or colored pencils, anything you would like. But I'm going to do my best to use paints for this one. And I have just a simple little palette here with acrylics. And hold on, I lost my other. There they are. They were underneath the piece of paper. Here are the acrylics that I am using. This is just a little simple set that I got at our pharmacy. And I think I'm gonna start out with our lactobacillus. And because I like the, the little lactobacillus being purple so much, those little germs, we're gonna start with purple. Hello to Megan, welcome. And Irshana, Philip, Kari, Annabelle. Super happy to have you guys here with me today. Um, if you are not ready, don't worry. You can just watch and enjoy as I do my painting, and then you can print out yours and color it later, or you can also try going freehand. So if you didn't have time to print out the printout, then you can just get a blank piece of paper and do your best to draw some little boxes and just follow along as we talk about the good, the bad, and the bubbly. So I'll get it closer so that you have a little bit better view of my screen, and we'll begin. So the first good that we're going to talk about is lactobacillus. Lactobacillus are really fantastic, rather fantastic bacteria. As we mentioned in our earlier show, they're very important for our digestion and our overall health. If you have lactobacillus in your digestive system, not only do you get better nutrients from your food, but you have an easier time digesting your food because of the work that they do. And another cool thing about lactobacillus is that they can be used to turn milk into yogurt and to make, to help us with quite a few different types of fermented foods that we can make with them. So I'm gonna paint these guys purple, but you can use any color you want to paint your little lactobacilli. And then I might grab some little googly eyes or I might make some, some eyes out of white paper with black dots and put eyes on them afterwards because I think it would be kind of fun to give them some eyes. So we have two of our lactobacilli painted and I think we'll do a slightly darker and a little bit of blue for the next one because here's the cool thing about bacteria. They are not all the same. Every now and then you'll have a little colony of bacteria and you might get an interesting mutation that makes one of them a bit different than the others. So we're going to do still purple, but a little bit of blue mixed in over here for this guy. This guy's going to be a little different. You can see the shape's a little different too. Still a lactobacillus, still most of the same genes, and still very friendly, but a little bit more bluish. There we go. There's our lactobacilli. Lactobacilli are rod-shaped bacteria, and they, when they split to form new bacteria, they'll often get this sort of shape where they're, they're getting ready to divide. This one bacteria is gonna turn into two bacteria and they kind of pinch off in the middle to form their new bacteria. And then for our border around the side, I think it might be kind of nice to just give a little bit of a yellow line here. Purple and yellow are complementary colors. And I hope I said that right. Someone let me know in the chat if I said it wrong. Complementary means like they're kind of like opposite, right? Hello to Roseanne and Brenda, and shout out to Science Mom Liza who is in our chat. We're gonna make a nice yellow border around our lactobacilli. And maybe if we want, we could even fill in 
all of that space so that this is a nice little happy sunny yellow square for our bacteria. Yogurt is one of my one of my favorite foods. I really like yogurt a lot. And there are lots of different types of yogurt you can get. So we, we usually make yogurt out of cow's milk, but you can make yogurt from soy milk too. Soy milk's a little trickier to get the temperature to be right, but lactobacillus will convert soy milk to yogurt. Some of the other milks are harder because you need to have the right balance of sugars for the lactobacillus to eat. And I know in yesterday's chat, Science Mom Liza said she tried making coconut milk yogurt one time and it was an epic fail. It did not work at all. And sometimes that happens, especially when you're trying a new recipe. Sometimes things work out well, and sometimes they don't. I'm gonna add just a little bit more yellow here and fill in our border. And then we're gonna move on to the phytobacteria. And the phytobacteria are another type of bacteria that are really common in probiotics. And unless you are just finishing a course of antibiotics, you have both of these bacteria inside you right now. You have millions of lactobacillus in your digestive system and millions of the phytobacterium. And these bacteria are really good guys. They're really good to have around because they make it easier for you to get nutrition, nutrition from your food, make it easier for you to digest your food. <clears throat> there are all a lot of different benefits to having these probiotics around. Daniel says, I'm going too fast. Sorry, Daniel. Don't worry if you're behind. You'll have plenty of time to catch up. Hello to Luigi and to Pixelbit. Happy to have you guys here. All right, there are our lactobacilli. When we're talking about bacteria, when we're talking about just one bacteria, um, we usually say bacterium, one little bacterium, but there are all sorts of fun little ways that you can change the ending of the word. So lactobacillus just kind of generally refers to who these bacteria are, but if you have a bunch of lactobacillus together, we we'll call them lactobacilli. Oh, and Michael says he loves my t-shirt. Thank you. I don't know if I adequately showed it earlier, but it says, um, the element of uncertainty or indecision, I mean. So if you're undecided, that's um, the element of uncertainty. Now on to our, the phytobacterium. And these guys I think would look lovely, a nice little shade of green. So I'm gonna choose green, but you can choose any color that you would like for your phytobacterium. And I'm gonna paint them in green and then I'll paint the outline around. Here we go. And I am curious, tell me in the chat, because we, um, I was thinking that it might be better for tomorrow and Friday to just move um, the painting with the scientist onto YouTube. But I'm curious how many people are watching on Facebook and would you be able to watch on YouTube instead? So say in the chat, say hello real quick if you're watching on Facebook and say hello, um, especially let me know if you would not be able to move to YouTube because tomorrow my plan is to have this just be on YouTube for the painting with the scientist. Quarantine will be on both, but we're thinking that we should move this one over to YouTube. Our little phytobacterium are all looking nice and green. And it occurs to me that just like we painted one of these guys different to show that bacteria can, can really have a lot of variety and change, I should paint one of these, the phytobacterium, a little bit different too. So I'm gonna grab just a little bit of blue and mix it in with my green. Grab a little water so that hopefully it's not too dark. And then let's add, add a little bit of a deeper blue to this guy. Because the amazing thing about bacteria is that they are always changing. They're always changing and evolving. 
And that's why antibiotic resistance is such, such a big deal. Because if you have a couple billion bacteria and then you expose them all to an antibiotic, most of them will die. But some of them won't. Some of them will survive. And the ones that survive, they can develop resistance. I'm checking the chat real quick. Roseanne says on Facebook, can't move to YouTube. A couple people are saying they're fine moving to YouTube. Natalie says prefer Facebook. And but it looks like most people are moving to YouTube. Or most people are okay moving to YouTube. Here's the here's the the reason why I ask, because um, when we we I like to have moderators in the chat just to make sure that we we have a safe chat environment. And um, that represents a cost on our end. So if we can have some volunteer moderators on Facebook, I'm willing to keep it on Facebook. But otherwise, I'm trying to, just trying to be wise with how we use our resources. I'm gonna do orange for my background here. You guys can use any color you want for your background. And then Daniel says he has a math question for Math Dad. And you guys know yesterday I tried my whistle and it didn't, didn't work because math dad had gone outside with the kids, but I can hear him in the other room. So I'm gonna do my whistle now and bring him in real quick to answer your question. All right, Daniel, hold on. Hey, hey come on in. Daniel has a math question for you. Oh. Real fast. All right. Hey, Daniel. Oh, you called it drawing with a scientist instead of painting with a scientist. Oh, so I whoops. struggled to find it. Oh, I'm so, sorry. That's totally I'm my mistake. I'm hoping on the Science Mom YouTube channel it would show up. But um, scrolling. All right. Ask, oh. him, ask your math oh, question, Oh, he hasn't Daniel. asked the math question yet. Okay. Math Dad is here. Ask away. Hi, Hayden. I changed the math mystery. For, are you telling me I didn't do the right math mystery for today? Or from yesterday? That's the question. Hmm. We're, we're trying so, to... Oh, so, okay, so what is my favorite math lesson? Ooh, I think we'll probably talk about modular arithmetic next week. And that might be, so you're doing kind of clock arithmetic. Um, it, it may be my favorite subject as far as my favorite lesson goes. Well, we, we'll probably hit that one as well. I'm going to leave that as a surprise. Um, I'm going to call it a diehard problem. So, no, it's a good question. No, I actually have to go teach my office hour right now. He does. Yeah. And then um, Stradman wants to know if I know pi. I know 3.1415. And that's it. Nine. Nine. Now Math Dad just told me another, another number. So now I know another number of pi. 3.14159. That's that's the number of pi digits that I know. All right, I'll bring the view down a little bit lower. Um, David asked, so did we change the math mystery? Hopefully we did not make a mistake and introduce the wrong math mystery. Um, but if you'd find that the one we talked about doesn't match the notes, let us know and we will we will fix that. All right, back to our bacteria here. Finishing up the border here for my Bifidobacterium, another wonderful little probiotic that we have in our digestive system, helping us to digest our food. And most bacteria have either circular or rod shapes. They're either going to be nice and round, like our MRSA over here, or they're going to be rod shaped. And the reason why is because when bacteria are rod shaped, that gives them just a little bit higher surface area relating to what's inside. So if you look at a circle, a circle has the smallest surface area for the volume or what's inside. A rod shape has a little more surface area, which lets it do a better job of taking in nutrients. So this rod shape for bacteria is really common. We see that a lot. Oh, David Sanders said it was supposed to be 10 and 4, not 10 and 7. Whoops. I will let Math Dad know about it. That's kind of funny. So, yep, everybody makes mistakes, even Science Mom and Math Dad. Thanks for letting us know. Now we're going to be on to the bad. So here's our good and then the bad. So let's get 
Let's see, what color should we do for influenza? I think we'll do a combination of some red and some green just for fun. Um, we'll do some red and some green and give it sort of a fun like brownish color. And here we go. A little bit of red up here. And kind of pull down in. A little bit of red up here and pull down in. And I'm going to make the, the little knobs that are sticking up. I'm going to do those first with kind of this more reddish. And then I'm going to mix in more green so that the body of our virus is more brown. So that'll give kind of a nice little like more of a 3D look to our virus if I make the little proteins that are sticking up one color and then make the body a little more brown. All, all viruses are going to have some type of protein on the outside and that protein is going to be really important for the virus to get inside the cell. It's kind of like the secret key that unlocks the cell. So the virus bumps up against a bigger cell these proteins interact and help the virus attach to the cell. And then the virus splits open and puts the DNA that's on the inside into the cell. And that DNA or RNA inside the virus is then gonna trick the cell into making more copies. Yep. And once it's made more copies, then it can break open the host cell and those thousands of copies will go out and infect new cells. And someone asks, Vivian asks if I can zoom, zoom in a little bit more. I will do my best. Brooke asks where I got my wig. I believe I got it on Patreon. Not, I can't believe I just said that. I'm, I'm reading things and trying to talk at the same time and my brain got confused. I got it on Amazon, got my wig on Amazon. And I just searched for a mad scientist wig and this nice blue one came up. And our influenza virus here now has some nice little red proteins that are painted. And I'm going to try to do my best to paint the body sort of a brownish color. So I've got my brush here. And I'm going to test that out. And I think I want a little bit more green because that is not looking as brown as I was hoping. So I'm going to grab a little more green and mix it in. One fascinating discussion that I've always liked is the question of whether viruses are alive or not. Because you can make pretty good arguments both ways. Viruses are able to reproduce. They're able to take over other cells and make more copies of themselves. And they certainly can cause a lot of a lot of disruption, and they can spread all around the world like COVID-19 has done. But does that make them alive? Because if you just had a virus by itself, or even 100 viruses by themselves, you would never, you would never be able to, to make a new virus. So if you have 100 viruses by themselves, and you're not able to make a new virus, then is a virus alive? It's a really interesting question. And I see Stradman is asking if I can please go slower. Um, I'm not going to be able to slow down too much because I want to paint this by the by 10 o'clock. I want to have this all painted. But I will try to slow down a little bit. And then remember, because you can print out the outline, you don't need to finish it at the same time that I do. You know, if you if I finish my influenza and you haven't finished your influenza, you can move on to the next one and then you can come back and finish it afterwards. So don't feel like it's a, a rush or a contest. You don't need to be painting the same speed that I am. And it's perfectly okay to pause and take breaks. And you can even pause this video too. If you want to pause the video, you can finish painting your influenza and then just push play again once you're done. Or you can come back afterwards. So definitely don't feel like you're in a rush or that you have to do it the same pace that I do. Yep, and I, I do need to finish by 10 o'clock at the latest, 
but it'll I'll, I'll be done just as soon as I finish this painting. So there's our influenza molecule. Now, a really good question to ask yourself is, if you got a flu shot this year, why do you need to get a flu shot next year? Why isn't the flu shot that you got this year good for, you know, forever? And that's because viruses mutate and change. And every single year, our flu virus is different enough that your immune system is not going to recognize it. Because the flu bounces between so many different animals. The flu infects humans. It infects mammals. It infects pigs and cows. It infects birds. And since it lives in all of these, oops, sorry, I hope that wasn't too loud. Since it lives in all of these different types of animals, birds and mammals and people, and it's jumping back and forth between them, it's going to mutate more than another virus would that only lived in one host. And when it mutates, if these proteins change, and you can just kind of imagine, let's say your immune system could recognize these little red knobs. And anytime it saw one of these little red knobs, it was like, aha, that's the flu, attack. If those knobs all of a sudden changed, and let's say that they turned purple, I'll draw one of these, put some purple on one of these. And if they all turned purple, then your immune system's not going to recognize it. So we'll, we'll show that this virus is in the process of mutating. We've got a purple, couple purple knobs there. And that's why every year there's a new flu vaccine. Sometimes the flu vaccines they make are a good match. Sometimes they're not as good of a match. It all depends on how good of a job we do predicting how it's going to mutate. Because the flu has been around for so long, we're able to track it and able to predict a little bit how it will change. And sometimes our predictions are exactly right and the flu vaccine provides really good immunity. And other times our, vac our vaccine predictions are not quite as right and the flu vaccine only provides partial immunity. It varies a bit year to year. But if you get the flu vaccine, there's always, you know, it's, your chances of getting severely sick from the flu are always gonna be lower. And we should just talk real quick about side effects from vaccines because there are side effects from vaccines and some of them can be pretty severe. And that's probably the main reason that you've seen this anti-vaccine movement. But I will say that the, the link between vaccines and autism has been thoroughly disproven, debunked. Vaccines do not cause autism and the benefit to getting vaccinated does outweigh the risks. All right. We didn't talk about malaria and I already covered him. So let's say a little bit about bacteria. Jane says she's making all of the bad bacteria look evil. You could definitely add some angry eyes to these little, these little bacteria and villains over here. But our malaria is actually not a bacteria. So bacteria, they don't have a nucleus. They're very simple cells. Malaria is a larger, more complex cell. It is a eukaryotic cell. It has a nucleus on the inside and it has a fairly complex life cycle. It infiltrates a mosquito and looks one way and then it infiltrates human beings and looks a different way. Ooh, want a quick shout out to Nerding for Nature. Nerding for Nature has a YouTube educational YouTube channel, my good friend from up in Canada. And she says getting the flu vaccine will make your flu less intense if you do end up getting the flu. And I've found that to be true as well. The years that I've gotten a flu shot and I have gotten the flu, I've only had the flu, a bad case of the flu twice. But the one time I got it, I had already been vaccinated and it, I was pretty sick for about a week, but I recovered and it wasn't too bad. The other year I got it, I hadn't yet gotten a flu vaccine. I usually do get a flu vaccine, but I was late that year and it was terrifying. I, I was almost hospitalized and had trouble breathing and it was really quite frightening. Pixel bit says it's hailing in California. Whoa! There's our malaria. Malaria is one of the most deadly diseases on the planet. If fortunately, if you live in a temperate climate, um, somewhere where you get change of seasons, you're not very likely to encounter malaria because it has to have that mosquito host, and the mosquito that it lives in only lives in tropical climates. But malaria is a real, real bad one. And then down here we have salmonella. And I'm going to paint our salmonella kind of an orangish purple. I'm choosing nice wild colors for this one because it just kind of makes it more fun to have some variety here. So we're going to do a little stripe of orange in our E. coli. And this also sort of reminds me of, 
of eggs. The orange and the yellow and the purple that I'm putting together kind of have like a food gone bad feel to their colors. So I think they'll work quite well. You can get salmonella from chicken or eggs that are not cooked properly, or sometimes there's even salmonella poisoning on certain vegetables. And it just all depends on like what water is being used to produce your food and the conditions that they have there. But if you have salmonella in your food and then you eat that food, once this bacteria gets inside your system, it can start to multiply, 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 and you'll get more and more of it. And then it actually produces a bit of a toxin. And it's that toxin that makes you so sick. So that then you end up throwing up and having bad diarrhea and feeling miserable. So you don't ever want to get salmonella poisoning. That's no fun at all. Next, we're going to move up and do MRSA. Now, MRSA is a type of bacteria as well. So these two right here are bacteria. This is a like, kind of like a little animal is a better way to think of it. It's a eukaryotic cell, much more complex than a bacteria. And then influenza and COVID-19 are going to be our viruses. But this MRSA, this is a bacteria that is the staph bacteria. And there are so many different types of staphylococcus bacteria. They're pretty common. But MRSA is one that developed antibiotic resistance. Because the truth is, when it comes to antibiotics, we use them too often. And we have not been good about using them correctly and about avoiding overprescribing. Many doctors will overprescribe antibiotics. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Partly because they, you know, when people come in to see a doctor, they want to be treated. They want to get medicine. And if the doctor thinks like, oh, this person's not going to leave me alone until I give them a, a prescription, sometimes doctors will prescribe antibiotics, even if the infection, they know it's viral. And that's a bad idea because anytime you prescribe an antibiotic, you're increasing the chance that the bacteria that are exposed to that antibiotic, that they could develop resistance. And that's what happened with MRSA. MRSA stands for multiple resistant strepo streptococcal aureus, I think. Um, don't quote me on that scientific name. I may have mispronounced it. But this multiple resistant staph bacteria is really dangerous because if you get an infection, you're really your only hope is your immune system can fight it off. If your immune system can't fight it off, then we don't have medication that does a very good job anymore against MRSA. And because MRSA is starting to be more common, you're more likely to encounter it. And if you have lactobacillus and these other bacteria inside you, then most likely the MRSA is not going to get established. But if you don't have good bacteria inside you, like if you've been on an antibiotic or you're fighting, fighting another infection, then MRSA can be super dangerous. So if you hear about someone who has a MRSA infection and is in the hospital, you should definitely send them a card, reach out and ask what you can do to help them. You know, maybe they have a pet at home you can help take care of because MRSA is bad news. And these little MRSA bacteria right here, I think they will look a little more three-dimensional if we add a little shadow. So I'm going to try and add kind of a little, a little light highlight right here. I'm going to take my white paint and I'm going to put a little dot right by where I was mixing my purple paints. And then I'm going to mix it in with the purple to make it lighter and see if we can get just a nice little highlight going. So here's my white, mixing it in with my purple till I get kind of a little lavendery type color. And then we're going to put them all on the same side. So there's my little highlight there on that side. There's a little highlight there on that side. Another little highlight here on this side. Hopefully that will give them a little more 3D appearance, like their, their nice round bacterium. A little highlight there. And that concludes our little painting of the Merso. Whoops, went a little extra with my highlights there, but that's all right. And if you had a MRSA infection, and it wasn't very bad, you are lucky because MRSA can be really scary if it gets out of control. Next, right down here, we have Candida auris. And this is not a bacteria, and it's not a virus. Any luck on what it is? 
It's a fungus. It is a fungus. And this Candida auris is starting to become a little more common. And someone asked, I saw that someone just asked in the chat, what happens if we don't have good bacteria? If you don't have good bacteria, then it's easier for the bad ones to move in. And that's super, super important because when those bad ones move in, that can be really dangerous. If your stomach is full of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, and one of these little candida auris comes in, these guys are going to be like, no, we live here. We like it here. You cannot have our food. And they're going to outcompete the candida. But if you go to the hospital and you're on antibiotics for some sort of infection, mm -hmm. you want to be taking probiotics mm -hmm. to try and get these guys back. And if you don't have enough probiotics, or if you're just unlucky to get this candida in your system, that can be really bad news because we do not have very good medications to get rid of fungal infections. And a lot of the medications we have have really bad side effects. So this one is a real bad one that you never want to have get established inside your digestive system or inside your body. And one thing about candida is that we often talk about antibiotic resistance with MRSA and bacteria, but resistance can happen with fungus too. And when it comes to fungi, we only have a few antifungal medications, a few antifungal drugs that work. And if the fungi develop resistance to those, like Candida auris has, then we're in a bad spot because it's a lot harder to develop good antifungals than it is to develop antibacterials. So there's our Candida auris, which I colored kind of greenish, although I don't know that green's a very good color for Candida because it is not photosynthetic. It is a mushroom. It is not a mushroom, it's a fungus. But a lot of people think that fungi are plants, and that's one of my that's one of Science Mom's pet peeves. Anytime people say that fungi are plants, I'm like, no, not plants. So I'm going to give this candida some yellow spots to make sure that it does not look as planty. So here we go. Some nice little yellow spots on our candida. Boom, 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 boom. Ta-da! There's our candida. And King Cat says you might get a fungal infection if you don't have probiotics. And that is true. You want to be careful to, to make sure that you have probiotics so that you're less likely to have these bad guys move in. And now let's paint our star of the star of the year. COVID-19 has totally transformed. The world in the past six months. It's kind of unprecedented to have, you know, so many people under stay-at-home orders and the everything has changed because of this virus. Now this virus is not as deadly as something like rabies, but it is more deadly than the flu. The death rate for COVID-19 is a bit higher than the flu and it's still one that we're really concerned about, but some people who get COVID-19, they don't have any symptoms and they can actually pass the virus on to other people without ever knowing that they're sick. And that's why there's been such a concern with, you know, trying to have people stay home and not, not be exposed to other people because if hospitals get overwhelmed, that's a really big deal. And I, I saw a good question. Natalie asked, what does Candida auris do? If you get an infection of Candida auris, and if that infection kind of gets into your lungs, it makes it very difficult to breathe. And it can also get into your bloodstream. And if it gets into your bloodstream, that's really bad news. And it causes what we call sepsis. If you have an infection in your bloodstream, your bloodstream is like, it's warm. There are nutrients and sugars in there. And it's an environment that if bacteria or fungi get in there, they can grow really, really fast. And if they do grow fast and they start to produce toxins, then it can, it can cause you to lose cons consciousness and go into a state called sepsis, and that can be fatal. That can be really bad. So you definitely want to avoid ever having that happen if you can help it. And Love Cat Meow Meow asks, 
wait, so I could have the coronavirus? You know what, right now with how many people in the world um, have had it and how many people we think have been exposed, it is entirely possible that someone watching this live stream right now could have the coronavirus but might not have any symptoms and not even know they have it. That's entirely possible. And if you're one of the asymptomatic people, then that's good news for you because some people when they get coronavirus, especially if they are over the age of 75 or if they have diabetes or heart disease, some people when they get it, they get really, really sick. And you know, if they're not able to go into the hospital, they might die from it. So it all depends on your immune system response and how big of a dose you get too. That's the thing about viruses. If you just get exposed to one virus, that's not going to be as hard on your body as if you all of a sudden get exposed to several million viruses going into your lungs. So with a virus, it depends on the load. We call that the initial load that you get. So your initial viral load can be small or it could be really high. It, it just depends. So we've finished coloring the bad. And if you want with markers or with paints, paints are going to be a little bit trickier. You can use any type of art supply that you want. You can color in these letters too. These letters are sure to fun and, you know, kind of scratchy on the edges. It looks like a, a good bad guy font to me. So I'm going to color in real quick the bad here. And you can see that for bad infections, we have a really wide variety of cells. We have bacteria, we have fungi, and we have our malaria, our eukaryotic cell that's more bigger and more complex. And then for viruses, there are a lot of different types of viruses too. So here we have our little collection of bad bacteria. And after we paint the label here, we'll be ready to move on to the bubbly, which I'm quite excited about. I got two good examples here in our bubbly collection. There we go. All right, real good question right here. Um, why don't some people have symptoms when COVID-19 has symptoms? This is a great question. It's actually such a good one. I'm gonna come up here and, and answer it real quick. So let me tell you about the time that I got the flu and a really bad case of the flu. I got H1N1, the swine flu that was going around in 2009. And within just a couple hours, I could hardly breathe. I had a high fever. I had body pain through my whole body and I had a really bad cough and I felt terrible. Now I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old at the time. And if you have a little two-year-old or four-year-old brother, you know that they're kind of like virus vectors. Anything that they have, you have, and any germs that you have, they're gonna get because they don't have any personal space and they're always like coughing on your face or like grabbing your food and eating it. So you're gonna share germs with a two-year-old if you live with a two-year-old. Now, when I got the flu, for sure, my two-year-old and four-year-old were also exposed to the flu, but they didn't have the same symptoms I did. They, they seemed to have a cold, but they didn't really get sick. And it's a combination of how many virus particles you get and the just chance of how your immune system reacts. If you happen to have a white cell bump into the right virus really early on, you're going to develop immunity sooner. But if just by chance that white blood cell doesn't bump into the virus until later, then you're going to develop immunity a little bit later. Now, um, is there any way to prevent these viruses here? It really comes down to a lot of what you're hearing right now. Wash your hands. That's a big one. Don't put your fingers into your mouth or your nose. That will help you prevent getting any of these. But our probiotics over here are also an important part. You want to make sure that you have those good bacteria inside you. And ways that you can get good bacteria inside you, if you do not like yogurt or you're allergic to dairy, yogurt is not your only option. Sauerkraut also has good probiotics in it. And if you don't like sauerkraut and you don't like yogurt and you don't like kefir and you don't like kimchi, all those foods that have probiotics in them, you can also just get a, get like a little vitamin bottle that has probiotics where they've just um, dehydrated them, just like yeast can be dehydrated. And you can, you can take that. So there are lots of options for getting probiotics. Now let's come over, I'll come over to this side and move our, our art palette just a little bit. 
so that we can do the bubbly. So here we have Saccharomyces. This is brewer's yeast, the same yeast that we use to kind of blow up our little balloons a little bit. And it is a super useful yeast for us. We use it to make all sorts of foods. Bread is one of the most common. So when you make bread or pizza dough, this is what you're doing. You're putting billions of these little tiny, tiny fungi into the bread. They start eating the starch and the sugars and they make carbon dioxide. And then that carbon dioxide gas is what makes the bread rise and gives the bread that nice texture. So I'm gonna paint these guys orange, kind of an orangey color. And then once I paint them orange, I think I might get kind of a light brown and do a little bit of a light brown background, just so it looks a little bit like bread. See if I can do a really light brown. And if you have never ever made pizza dough or bread, it's a fun thing to do. I would encourage you to give it a try. If you are gluten intolerant, and you know, I have celiac disease and can't handle gluten, there are lots of other types of flour that you can use. And you can even go wild and make sourdough bread. You don't have to go to the store and get yeast, you can cultivate your own. And that's a really cool thing to do too. If you just look up online how to make sourdough bread, you'll find some good tutorials and they'll give you ideas for how you can make your own bread just using the wild yeast that is in your kitchen right now. Any surface in your house that you were to touch, if you got a good enough sample from it, you would find strains of wild yeast. So they're on my hand right now, they're on this whiteboard right now, pretty much everywhere, you're gonna have at least a few little strains of wild yeast. And most of these are good guys. They're yeast that are, um, they're gonna be just fine, they're not gonna cause problems for you, but they can, help us by fermenting food and doing some cool things there. Ooh, and Heidi says that her kids love fermented carrots and daikon. Make it at home and it lasts for months. Awesome. Vietnamese episode, episode uh, she said it was a Vietnamese recipe. There are lots of options for adding probiotics to your diet. I'm mixing some brown with some white and orange. And then we're gonna paint a background. Ooh, and Nora asks, what would happen to our world without bacteria and how would the world react to it? If all of a sudden we had no bacteria at all, we would be in big trouble. Ooh, and that looks too orange. I definitely want more brown, just a second. I'm gonna add more brown and more white. So the bacteria perform so many important jobs, not just for us with lactobacillus helping us digest food, but in oceans, they're a really important part of just how nutrients cycle. And then in soil, the way things break down in soil, bacteria do an important job there as well. And if all of a sudden you had no bacteria, it wouldn't be long before certain ecosystems started to have big trouble. And if we didn't have you know, the oceans producing as much oxygen, and if we didn't have things decomposing the way that they have, where you know you can have leaf litter break down into soil, that would that would cause huge problems. I think it would probably take, you know, six months to a year before we'd see some of those changes, but it would be a big deal. Our world definitely needs bacteria and other microbes. Good question. This angle is just a little bit trickier for me coming over from the top, but I'll do my best to do our background here around our yeast with my kind of light brownish color. And feel free to use any colors you want. And if you accidentally paint over your circles a little bit, that's all right. After this layer dries, you can always come back and paint over your circles again. Or you can just say, I meant to do that. Call it a happy accident and come up with a reason for why this circle circle should be a little misshapen. Maybe it's kind of hiding behind some of the some of the bread or something. That's totally fine. Oh, I'm gonna call that a happy accident right there. We've got a little more character here on the bottom with my paint going outside of the border. And that is a-okay. There we go. My yeast. 
And I think these yeast would look excellent with some little tiny eyes. I'm definitely going to color on some faces with a Sharpie marker once we, once we finish our drawing. So let me bring my water over here real quick. And next, we're going to do the methanogens. These ones right here are last little bubbly bacteria. I think are so awesome. They're actually not bacteria. They're in the Archaea kingdom. And they are what we call extremophiles. They love extreme environments. And the methanogens, they really like an environment that has no oxygen whatsoever. In fact, they cannot tolerate oxygen. If you have a nice little collection of methanogen bacteria and they're bubbling along and they're making methane gas, because that's what these do. They make methane and they live in swamps. And if you say, here, have a little oxygen, these guys are just like, Ugh! and they die. They cannot handle oxygen. Most of the living things that we know like oxygen and they need oxygen, but the methanogens cannot tolerate oxygen at all. They need an environment with no oxygen. So let's paint our swamp water right here, a nice deep blue. And then I'm gonna come up with some fun, bright colors for our methanogens because these guys are really cool. And if there is a swamp or a wetland near where you live, you should go out to the marsh, especially if there's like a marsh area with a bunch of cattails and water that is completely still. Go out to the marsh and just be quiet for a bit and look at the water and see if you can find a spot where you have bubbles coming up. And if you spend just a minute looking, you will find one. You'll find a spot where there are a whole bunch of bubbles just slowly rising up. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And those bubbles are caused by methanogens. They're caused by bacteria that are breaking down some of the nutrients that are in that swampy area. And since that water is so quiet and it's not moving around at all, down in the mud, you get an area that has no oxygen. And the methanogens, that's what they like. They live in that area with no oxygen and they are breaking down different, you know, dead leaves and other things. And when they do that, one of their byproducts is methane. And what you're seeing is the little, little tiny bubbles of methane coming up. Our little border here. Oop, my paintbrush got just a little bit wetter, so I'm going to try and just go real quickly around my methanogens so then I can paint them later. Ooh, and I kind of dripped, but that's all right. We'll just get a little tissue paper and dab that drip. And then we'll get a little more blue and color in our swampy water. And I think our swampy water would look better if it got if it got darker and more muddy at the bottom. So that's what I'm going to try and do next. This part up here will be all blue, but I'm going to try and add a little bit of a layer of brown down here at the bottom because our methanogens really like that brown, mucky, muddy water in a swamp or a wetland where everything is quiet and still and you do not have oxygen getting in. So our water starts out nice and blue up here. And now I'm going to get just a little bit of brown, mix it in with my blue. And I'm going to do a little bit of a brownish down here at the bottom to sort of represent that nice, thick, oozy swamp mud, because that's where our methanogens like to live. Whoops. Sorry, methanogen, I just got you all muddy. Okay, now we're ready to color the methanogens themselves. Although because I got these guys a little muddy, I think I'm gonna come up here and do my cattails first. So get some nice green for the cattail leaves. And then we will get some brown. And I see that um, Michelle asks, will the methane hurt you? Or, or no, Nathaniel. Nathaniel asks, will methane hurt you? Methane will if there's too much of it. So methane is a gas that is maybe kind of funny in small doses because it's something that's in farts. So if you've ever smelled a stinky fart, you've probably smelled some methane. 
and there are sulfur compounds that can be made as well that often give stinky gas its flavor. But in large doses, methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, and it's also a gas that is poisonous to us to breathe. If you breathe in a little bit of methane, you're totally fine. But if you were breathing in mostly methane, you would lose consciousness and you would not be fine. And then the last but not least, methane is really flammable. So if you had a bunch of methanogens, usually in a swamp, you'll only see like a little tiny bubble here and there. But if you had a bunch of them together and the bubbles that they were making were really big and there was a spark, those bubbles could actually light on fire. And if you were close by to that methane when it lit on fire, that could be dangerous. So methane is, it's all about the dose. It's about how much there is. A little bit of methane is fine. Too much methane, I'm not okay. But I think methanogens are really cool just because the way that they get energy is so unique. There are not any other organisms that can live without any oxygen like they do and then pull material from dead leaves and things and then produce methane as a byproduct. It's a really, really unique way of living. So I think they're pretty awesome creatures. All right, time for some color on our methanogens. I'm going to pick some nice bright colors and I'm gonna give each one a different color if I can, because there are a lot of different types of methanogens. Some of them are circular, some of them are rod shaped, but they all the thing they all have in common is that they're all back archaea. So they're older than bacteria and they all like this extreme environment of having no oxygen at all. They cannot handle having oxygen. Here's our rod-shaped methanogen. We'll do him kind of a nice red and then kind of mix in some yellow too. And then for the next one, let's go kind of purple. We'll do purple along with some white to give sort of a lavender color. And we'll make our paint nice and thick so it stands out. There's our purple methanogen. And then for our next one, I think we'll go kind of a greenish color. We'll get sort of this turquoise green. You know, it's really amazing just to think about the variety of life that you have in a swamp. A swamp an area of water that's just quiet and still. It might look kind of boring, like there's not much going on, but if you go down to the microscopic level, because swamps are wet and they have so much water and they usually have a lot of nutrients too, there is so much going on in a swamp. Swamps and wetlands are really neat, neat environments. I'm gonna give this side just a little smattering of kind of polka dotty, orange polka dots. And then let's see what other colors should we get. Let's do let's do a purple that is mixed with red. See if we can get a red and purple mixture here. So I'm mixing my red and my purple together. They're not mixing super well. I think it's going to look more red than purple, but we'll just give it a try and see what it looks like. Oh yeah, that looks very red. You can't even tell I mixed in the purple. Whoop. That's all right. I like it. Got a little red methanogen there. We'll give him some purple polka dots. And then I think we'll do one more orange and yellow one for our last one. So here is our orange and yellow methanogen right up here. There we go. I'm happy with it. And if you are doing this along with me, be sure to, um, you can share your picture on social media and tag me. I would love to see your art too. The last thing to do is to fill in our, the bubbly here. And I think, I think a nice kind of light blue would be very nice here. Ooh, and I just saw, holy cow, you guys, it's 1010. I'm gonna fill in my little bubbly thing here later because I have got to get going. But before I do, I will pull this back and just take a couple questions if anyone has questions about bacteria and then I've got to go. I lost track of time while we were painting. I was having too much fun. All right. 
Why is Math Dad never on your video? I haven't seen him in a week. He's on quarantine. So she, um, Math Dad is on quarantine that we do for the first hour from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, or sorry, no, from eight o'clock to nine o'clock Pacific time or for 11 to noon Eastern time. That's where you'll find Math Dad right now. Math Dad is holding office hours um, and doing some other work while I do the painting one. Um, Nishkal is singing Math Dad's song, which I have in my head now. Thanks a lot, Nishkal. Um, Luigi asks, how is something a coronavirus? This is a good question. So viruses come in different families. We call viruses that have a similar structure. We kind of group them together in names. So there is influenza, but within the influenza family of viruses, there are lots of different types of influenza. We have influenza A and B. We have um, H1N1. Sometimes when there's a new strain of influenza that acts differently than the others, we'll give it a special name. There are lots of different types of influenza, but they're all round little viruses that have really similar proteins along the outside. Coronaviruses are viruses that affect the inside of your nose and into your lungs. So are rhinoviruses. And those viruses, we've given names and we group them just based on how similar they are. So MERS, SARS, and COVID-19 are all coronaviruses. They all have similar proteins and they have similar symptoms where when someone gets a coronavirus, if they get really sick with it, they're gonna have some difficulty breathing. They're gonna have a cough. They're gonna have a fever. Couple other questions. Oh, Nishkal, apologies, I mispronounced your name. Uh, can you have two viruses at once? This is a good, good question from both Sophie and from Stradman. You can have two viruses at once, and if you get multiple infections at the same time, that can be bad for your immune system, and your immune system can have a trouble overcoming them. So, I mean, you could get exposed to a virus, to a fungus, to a bacteria. If you got exposed to several bad ones all at the same time, then you would be in, that would be bad, bad news for you. Fortunately, if you have um, exposure to one virus, oftentimes if you get sick, you'll be staying home and you're less likely to get exposed to something else. Ooh, and here's a good question. What happens if two kinds of the same virus enter your body? That's how much virus you get is called the viral load. So some, some viruses like tetanus, if you get just one tetanus virus inside you, that can be enough to cause an infection. But a lot of other viruses will have a threshold where if you only get one or two, they're not gonna be able to build up fast enough to cause you to get sick. Your immune system is gonna find them first and squash them and they'll be gone. But if you get a couple million viruses in at the same time, then you are gonna get sick because there are too many and your immune system can't get rid of them first. How many particles you have to get to get sick is gonna be different for different viruses, but for most of them, you have to get more than one. You have to get a few virus particles in. Usually when you're exposed to a virus, you are gonna be exposed to more than one particle because if someone is sick and they cough on their hand and then they shake your hand, you're not just getting one virus particle on your hand, you're getting millions of virus particles on your hand. And then if you put your finger in your nose and pick your nose, you're not just putting one virus particle in your body, you're probably putting thousands of virus particles in your body. So usually when you get exposed to a virus, you get exposed to more than one. Daniel asks, what is my favorite good and bad bacteria or virus? Good question. I think my favorite good virus, I mean good bacteria, is lactobacillus. I really like lactobacillus, the one that we can use to make yogurt. And I think the bad bacteria or bad mm -hmm. virus, boy, number one bad virus would be rabies. It's probably the most deadly virus we know of. And then um, bad virus, bad bacteria, Probably MRSA. MRSA is a really terrible bacterial infection. I hope that you never get MRSA. I hope that I never get MRSA. Nishkal says, I'm your biggest fan. Thank you, Nishkal. And one last question. Is it possible you're exposed to a virus, but you don't know that you got the virus? That is 100% possible, and it happens more often than you would think. Your immune system is amazing. And behind the scenes, there are little battles being waged with you inside you all the time that you don't even know of. And most of those battles, you are winning. You are exposed to new viruses and bacteria all the time. And nine times out of 10, when you get a bad bacteria inside you, your immune system is like, aha, and it gets rid of it. But it's that time when your immune system doesn't catch it soon enough and you get sick. That's when you, when you know that you've been exposed to a virus. But a lot of us are gonna be exposed to viruses and not even know it because we have immune systems that work 
and our immune systems are going to take care of them. All right. We have got to, um, I've got to go now. Thank you for being good in the chat, you guys. And please, um, please remember to not call each other scammers and to keep our discussion related to what we're doing. And I will see you again tomorrow.